Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today in the studio with me is my homeboy, producer, videographer, Vicky Vic, straight from San Diego. I want to welcome everyone once again to another chapter of The Architect. You are now, now listening to The Chapter of The Architect with DJ Architect. Architect. What's up, Vicky Vic? How you been, my brother? It's been a while. Hey, what's going on, man? It's been too long. Been too long. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I appreciate you taking the time to come over here to the studio, spend some time with us. Um, no doubt, no doubt. Obviously, you've heard the, the sad news that hit us last week with the Chargers leaving us <sighs> LA. Is that what we're starting off with today? Yeah, man. We oh. got, I listen, because I've been wanting to talk about this. Yeah. You know, I've been busy at work, and I really haven't had the chance to uh, to elaborate on my feelings uh, regarding the Chargers leaving. What what's your uh, take on this? I mean, it it there's a lot of bl blame to pass around from the mayor to the owner of the Chargers to just every everybody. So it's I, I don't think it's one party's fault. It's just so hard to get a, a stadium built in California nowadays. I, I heard the Raiders are going to be moving to Vegas now. They just filed. So, but uh, to stay on the Chargers is just oh man, it's 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 tough because San Diego only has one sports teams left now, right? The Padres. The Padres. You know their stadium is beautiful. Yeah. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I'm not too much of a Padres fan. I, the truth is, I'm from New York. Obviously, you know this. And I've been to more Charger games in my 16 years here in San Diego than I went to any football games while I was in New mm. York. Um, man, it it just it's a punch in the gut, and I know the majority of individuals here in San Diego, it, it, you know, they're pissed, they're hurt, they feel betrayed by this meathead owner. Yeah, and you know, in all honesty, I don't think he wanted to stay here anyways. I think his whole plan was to go up to L.A. The sad thing about it is the fans, they feel like it's a divorce between uh, a wife and the person that is with the, the wife, the new person, mm -hmm. is smacking her up and doesn't want her. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Because the people in LA don't want the Chargers. At all. They don't want them at all. At the same time, I I really do feel strongly. Like if the Chargers came out fourteen and two this season and they went to the Super Bowl, the fans are gonna come out. I feel like because L.A. is just the population is so high there that everybody loves a winner, no matter where you're at. So if they can win, I feel like that'll kind of bring them up. You know, top three maybe in in L.A. with you know. But just like anywhere else, but yeah, it, it's, a tough, it's a tough loss for San Diego. Baseball is a totally different animal. There's no salary cap in baseball, so that's why Padres are near the bottom every year. But oh uh, man, look, I my personal opinion is <clears throat> it's gonna be a while before the Chargers start having a winning record. Mm. That's for sure. Uh, I love Rivers. Unfortunately, I think he might have another two, three good years yeah, left. Yeah, I agree. Two to three. Uh, it'd be wise for the Chargers to start looking for a new quarterback and having Rivers uh, start mentoring him and getting ready, uh, you know, for for to take his place. Really, let's be honest. Yeah. Uh, he might ask for a trade. Who knows? You know, at the end of the day, did did you hear that? Um, there's rumors going on that they're, they're trying to get the city of San Diego involved to do some kind of injunction to make the char the Chargers owner, Deve Dean Spanos, bring the Chargers back. I, I no highly way. doubt it. I highly doubt it. Yeah, it has something to do with <clears throat> that he wasn't acting in good faith. And mm. in reality, they were making, I believe, $350 million of profit of per money. year, per season. A lot of money. So it wasn't like he was losing money. Um, A lot of people say that, uh, well... Yeah. He just didn't want to use all his money to pay for the stadium. Well, but think about it. Okay, so check this out, right? He's going there as a bitch, as as an individual that's taking his team out there to go pay rent. It's the Rams owner who's building mm -hmm. that stadium with his own money. So why couldn't uh, Spanos do that here in San Diego? Good point. 
Plus, great point. Um, the NFL was willing to help him out to help. You know what I mean? They were going to give him like what? Uh, I don't know if it was three hundred million or something to help him out with the mm. with the new stadium. Uh, so now the Chargers are going to play in the Rams studio and pay them rent when they were their own homeowners here. I, I Look, I understand that Qualcomm's a piece of shit, right? <laughs> I understand that. Yeah. Uh, but nonetheless, the Chargers are, are no longer here. So now for two years, they're going to play in a soccer stadium <laughs> that seats, what, 28,000? What compared a, to uh, wow. Qualcomm that seated 60,000. Wow. So they're, look, just to by end the Rivers seating. career there. Yeah, just by the seating, that's going to cut their profit in half. I'm not saying that they sold out seats every single week, and that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is um, the Galaxy, apparently they put out a statement stating that the soccer team will always and will continue to remain to be the priority in Los Angeles, and mm. the Chargers will play their game around their schedule. Mm. That's a soccer team, wow. man. I, look, I'm not a huge soccer fan, yeah, but let's be honest. I think you and I know that NFL football generates more income. Correct? Oh, yeah. Hey, everybody, this that's the number one sport in America, and it, it, it's by far, by far. Listen, so to have a soccer team tell a professional NFL team a – Take off your shoes, wipe your feet on the, uh, you know, on the mat. On the mat. Come inside, shut your damn mouth, and don't speak until I smack you in the face. Right? It's it's humiliating. Yeah, it's hey, you, humiliating. you know they're not. I mean, the teams in L.A. that I put in front of the Chargers, of course, are the Raiders, the Rams, the Lakers, the Clippers, even the Bruins. Now that they're ranked number four in the country in basketball. Right. What are the charge that's leaves charges at like number six, maybe even seven. That they, yeah. they're like they're far behind back, but hey. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh it's a shame, brother, but we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna move on forward and we're gonna talk about the great things you're doing as a producer and as well as a videographer. Let's get into you and producing tracks. Growing up. Who was a major influence for you musically? Man, musically. Well, my dad, my dad was a mariachi singer, and uh, so he. That, I guess that's my first exposure to music that I got. I remember when he would. She was trying to get my mom back. You know, he'd come at two, three in the morning, sing a mariachi song, right, right outside. Uh, so that that was like my first ex- exposure to music, and it just as I got older, you know. Uh, the hip hop is what what spoke to me, and you know, of course, Dre is, is was a big influence. But I mean, you have people like people that I look up, that I look up to now are like Black Milk, you know, a producer from Detroit. He produced a lot of big tracks. Um, Jay Dilla, of course, you know, who the way he was able to sample his 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 beats, right. chop them up a certain way, like no one else could. Like mm. people think, you know, it's a sample. I'm just going to loop it like it's if it's that easy let me see you do it like it's not you can do loops you know you could do a P Diddy loop where it's just a simple loop just add some simple drums which right. it works a lot of times but right. Jay Jay Dill I feel like brought it to a different level where he would chop it chop up, it fi- up. exactly chop it up finely and and, and and use those chops as a, as his instrument almost so uh you know I I find that absolutely to me chops it's a lot more work it's a lot more work than just to uh, grab a loop and then, like you said, just insert, uh, you know, a beat behind it. Yeah. Um, but those are the individuals that you you listen to or inspire you now. When no you were a kid, what were the the musicians that you were listening to when you were a little kid? Like still musicians? At home? I mean, I would say Tupac, my my favorite, one of my favorites of all time. You know. Um, I just remember getting that uh, the Chronic album though when I was oh, in third grade. The chronic. Yeah, I, the Chronic. We were talking about the Chronic with my homeboy Soprano on uh, his uh, when I had him, and um, yeah, we were talking about how how that was such a great album, influential yeah. beats. Yeah. Beats were bananas. Yeah, it was you know he was coming right off of the 
the NWA legacy, right, and coming into the Chronic of Death Row, and actually even before that, the Warren G album, the G Funk era, like that production just just stood yeah. out to me because no one at that time, no one in hip hop had sampled funk. Yeah, you know, it was the East Coast had sampled right. what they had sampled, and right. it was not funk at all. No, that know? was a uh, a lot of it was uh, old R and B, some of it uh, disco. Yeah, right. Yeah, so it. it I, that stood out to me, you know, when I was growing up, you know, Warren G, Pac, just the, the production that they, they had on their albums. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Growing up, Daz and Corrupt, of course, Nate Dogg. It's, it's that whole, that yeah. whole West, Coast West Coast era as a little kid, yeah, you know. Absolutely. But as I, you know, grew older, you get influences from different, you know, different areas i see i thought growing up i'm gonna make beats like that and i make beats nothing like that uh, west coast sound that you right, hear there yeah. that you think of you know yeah so I, I i was listening to, to some of your beats and um they, to me they sounded more a, a little bit east coastish, right 100 100 agree with yeah. you yeah and i was like wow this this guy you know i i, I not that i imagine it sounding west coast or east coast but i mm -hmm. you know that's the flavor that i got out of it um and you know what's funny like the nas like nas is i would say nas is the, my top three favorite rappers and nas lyrically i just ever since he came out with uh you know the still i am uh kid the ether on jay-z like oh, it, it, yeah. it, it, it that's when i started falling in love with the more i guess you could say tr traditional hip-hop beats like right. the samples like that boom bap yeah. like oh my gosh there's nothing like that yeah um yeah, that, that Tanaz is another one. Yeah, it it was written. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when he started messing around with Trackmasters, and yeah, that that album has a lot of great beat production. Not that Illmatic uh, doesn't. <clears throat> Excuse me, but uh, what what made you cho choose uh, beat production? I'm, I'm man, like music is. I would always, I would be the kid in the classroom banging on the desk, right? <laughs> but I would bang on the desk and make beats. Mm. So like that, I remember in high school we would, we would bang. I would bang on the table, and there'd be these three dudes that would just start rapping, and the cipher just began. Uh. Yeah, and that's what really made me fall in love with it but like you know I, I gotta be able to put this into a recording somehow right you know like banging on the tables pissing off my spanish teachers i do she <laughs> she made me get tested for add at one point because she couldn't handle me you you know? up, huh? <laughs> yeah and I, I they tested me for you know they answer all these questions and they're like yeah. no he's borderline he's okay yeah. like man that's just a condition you want to place on on me right now <laughs> but right. um yeah uh yeah, yeah, just banging on the beats, turning into the first program I ever used, Fruity Loops, way back in the day, back in 96, 97. So that's, that was going to be my next question. How old were you when you first made your first beat? Yeah, 96. I was in sixth grade, 12, 13? 13 years old. 13 years old, and yeah. you made your first beat. Yeah, it wasn't anything spectacular. No, 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 but... no, no. I mean, I'm looking at you uh, because at 13 was the first time I picked up a guitar. That, Cause that's how I got into music by playing guitar. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, but that's odd that at that particular age, you and I kind of started dabbling in music. So, what what software were you using? I was I was using Fruity Loops, and that's kind of, in my opinion, it still is to this day the most user friendly software. Like if you put someone in front of a computer and say, "Hey, make beats," you know, and you put Reason in front of them, you put MPC in front of them, mm -hmm. you put Fruity Loops. 99% of the time, Fruity Loops is going to be the program where... It's a lot... It's it's user-friendly? Yeah. More I mean, you, friendly, friendlier it's all than click. the others? You know, it's all click. You know, you don't even... You know, it's funny because when I was in Okinawa, Japan, me and my homeboy, uh, Nocturnal Son, he knew a guy at a different camp, which is a different base in Okinawa. We took right. a ride down. We took what's called the Loser Cruiser down there. It's like a cruiser. bus, right? <laughs> And uh, yeah, we walked up into his barracks room and he was utilizing Fruity Loops. And I was familiar with MIDI keyboards mm -hmm. and utilizing software that way. And he, all he had was a, a mouse. And I was, and he yeah. started playing these beats and I was like, holy crap, man, this kid's nice. How can you make that with the mouse? And then <laughs> I'm like, what the? I said, hey, man, where's your MIDI keyboard at? He goes, I don't need it. And he just started like putting together the sounds with the mouse. And I was like, like it, it. 
it didn't seem natural to me. Mm-hmm. I'm mm-hmm. more of a mm-hmm. like a, a a musician musician where I can pick up touch something. Yeah, I, I could pick up piano, guitar. I could pick up shit, man. It it, it, it kind of reminds me of you know the Departed. When uh, what's old boy from The Shining? What what's his, what's his name? Uh, Jack, Nicholson. Jack Nicholson. When Jack Nicholson says. It's uh, a great movie, The Departed. Yeah, I love that movie. Jack Nicholson says, uh, you know, John Lennon says, I'm an artist. You give me a fucking tuba, I'll get you something out of it. it, it that's, the <laughs> way I, that's the way I am. I don't know why, man. You know, maybe in my past life, I was a musician, whatever have you. Yeah. But I, 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 I've always been able to pick something up and make some fucking tune with it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So when he started making these... Uh, and it, it was good music. It was good beats. Right, right. With the... With the uh, with the mouse, I was like, it, it was unnatural to me. I was like, what definitely. The fuck, man? I was like, I don't get it. I don't get it. There's Dude. some. There's definitely, definitely something to be said about grabbing an instrument and playing what you feel, as opposed to point and click, right? right? Click, click, click. Yeah, it's but just, but but yeah, I, that's true. But nonetheless, it it still doesn't mean that because you're using a mouse, you're not you're going to come out with an inferior, no doubt, song or product. Mm-hmm. What's good is good. I, I, I like I said, I just been like I said, it, it, it just seems so unnatural to me for him to be making music um with a with a mouse. I was like, wow, this is this is crazy. So yeah. at thirteen you get Fruity Loops. Was Fruity Loops at that time, was it like a free software? It was it was the first version. So was it a free It was sp- not a free software, but I downloaded the trial version. I actually downloaded the bootleg of it. Uh, <laughs> bootleg of the program. Like <laughs> and we don't condone <laughs> we don't condone, on the chapter of the architect, we don't condone pirating a bootleg and <laughs> this is uh you know That the was when I was a, young and dumb. the accents of a thirteen year old young kid. <laughs> That's what the 56K modem. That took like two days to download that program, too. And if someone called during that download, bang, download got cut off. You remember that? Yeah. 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 Oh, where'd they get those sounds from? Isn't that the strangest thing? Oh, my goodness. I, I, I don't remember, man. But um, That's funny. So, so that's how you – because it amazes me. Uh, at 13 years old – I didn't even have a job yet. I saved up all my Christmas money, whatever allowance money I got, and that's how I ended up getting a piece of crap hundred dollar dollar guitar. But I saved up for it. Yeah. And I'm imagining, wow, at 13 years old, where the hell did you get the money to buy software? But obviously, we <laughs> <Right>. know. <laughs> and you know, it, it started from before that. As to far as like any- the music, I remember when the warehouse was around. My mom would give me five dollars allowance every week, right? So I'd go to the warehouse and get the local hot single, you know? Like, that was the only way to get music, and that's where it started from. I, I don't know if you remember the Here Comes the Hot Step, uh, like, yeah, dude, all those crazy ra- singles yeah, that you never yeah, hear yeah, of yeah, anymore, yeah. which I don't want to sample, by the way. Um, mm. But yeah, it started off with the warehouse, man, just buying those do- a single for three fifty, and it had a B-side on the tape, you know, you had a B-song. Um, do you recall, you recall the first beat you ever made? The first, yes, I do. I do. It had about it had a kick and a snare and a sin bass. <laughs> that was that was about it. That was, that was about it. Yeah, just you know, a verse and a chorus. And uh, actually, so, so at thirteen years old, you already knew how to arrange the music. I mean, yeah. I mean, I knew I knew it. It was verse chorus. You know, verse chorus. And and because did you know the breakdown of the bars? Yeah, in, in sixteen and eight. Yeah, and the thing is, see, me and my two best friends, Dwayne, who's from New York. Yeah. He loved his DMX, so I'd come with the Pac and the Dre, and he'd come with the DMX and the Nas, and that's what was so crazy. Like I had never gotten exposure to really that kind of music being, you know, out here on the West Coast. The, yeah. the West Coast music is big, just like I'm sure on the East Coast, Nas, Jay Z, everybody's big like that, right? Uh, so he would come and he would be the one rapping on the beat. So right. that's how I learned because he would rap, and I would be like, "Well, how long do you have to rap for?" So he was the one that gave you the breakdown of. Uh... Well, he uh, then I would listen to the the you know the beats. And I was like, okay, it's about what forty five seconds, a minute. And yeah. but yeah, he's the one that broke it down to me, like, oh, it's sixteen bars, man. Because I guess his uncle, his uncle has done music, oh, so he had already kind of had some knowledge. I was sixteen you. eight, sixteen eight. You know, yeah. you we all learn from somebody, you know. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, but it, 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 I mean, good for you, and you know, uh, kudos to him for teaching you at such a young age, man. I didn't learn how to do a sound structure or song structure. I'm sorry. Maybe I was like seventeen, eighteen years old when I first. You know, hey, fool, how many bars is that? 
Mm. I don't got what bars. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? And, and, and then slowly, like you said, somebody teaches you. I think the first song, hip hop song that I ever recorded, I was probably 18, 19 years old and I went in and there, I went in there and, and it was probably 22, 24 bars, a hook. The hook mm. was eight bars. And then another, the second verse was another twenty four bars. Okay, you know what I mean? it was a, yeah. a long, it, it was unconventional well, at the, the time, but it was ba- on us. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you went off with the bars. <laughs> you know, I didn't know how to how to um, how to do. But you know what? At the end of the day, man, even now as a, a seasoned musician or individual in music, it it look. Those are just rules and regulations. Somebody said, okay, this is the classical setup for airplay. Mm-hmm. But you know what? Who gives a damn? Yes. Who gives a... Because good... It, look, I know individuals that'll come up with two verses, a hook, uh, or just go straight verse, no hook. We'll do one verse. Uh, we'll have the hook within the verse and then we'll utilize those same words for the hook. I've done that before. Yeah. So at the end of the day... I, I I hate to think that original or or straightforward song structure should should make wherever the artist is taking that song it shouldn't constrict them the the song should go wherever the the artist wants to yeah. take it and if he says well shit man it's gonna be twenty six bars and you know one hook then that's what it is yeah you know no. what I mean. That's that's what I think Q Tip is is good at at doing with the especially I mean even on every single album but the latest Tribe album like man there's no like uh, you can't predict the structure of the songs he, he's good at, he's good with that and that's one thing I've had my respect for for him and the, the music that he's done with Tribe I mean they they've been around forever and they still find a way to stay relevant you know it, it and you know why man I think it's because it, I think it has to do with it original uh, originality. Like they don't give a fuck, man. They don't. They don't confine themselves to anyone else's thought of what music is supposed to be. <clears throat> and in reality, I think that's what sets great musicians apart from these cookie cutter motherfuckers. Mm-hmm. I, I I hate, and I don't want to talk negative uh, here in the chapter of the architect. You know what I mean? Because we're we're just trying to push knowledge and and all positive. No doubt. Um, but at the end of the day, is is I hate to hear the same cookie cutter music, um, and and nothing is inspirational, right? You know what I mean? It's 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 you almost have to dig now for yeah, the inspiration. It's, yeah, it's, it's not... really really hard to find somebody where you listen and and then you're like, whoa, who who the hell is this? Hmm. You know, it, it's 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 pretty difficult, and the airwaves. Um, are saturated with that type of music. And I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying, stop mimicking. You know, yeah. it, it might not be my cup of tea, but if if there's 25 people sounding alike, yeah, come there, on, man. There's got to be some kind of balance. Uh, yeah, if, that, man, if that's all the on. kids are hearing on the radio, then that's what they think hip hop is, like that, what it's supposed to be. You know, it, it, hip hop has never had a boundary, I feel like. Because you can literally sample from anywhere, man, anywhere. Right. The salsa merengue, the some Brazilian music, yeah. some Chinese music, like, and make it into hip hop, and absolutely, that, it's beautiful. Like, it's a beautiful art. It, hey, it, brother, go ahead and get yourself another drink. Over right. here in the chapter of the architect, uh, we're over here drinking. What are we drinking? Uh, Johnny Walker Black Label. That good stuff. The good. You know stuff. how to treat me. You know how to treat me, man. <clears throat> of course, man. Maybe uh, someday I'll have that green or that blue label. But uh, you know, talking about sampling music from from just about anywhere, I was probably maybe twenty one, twenty two years old, and my buddy uh, Danny Jimenez, my homeboy, he used to uh, from uh, from Queens. He moved out to Long Island. Him and I became real, real good friends. Uh, we knew this guy who had a studio in his. Uh, in his upstairs apartment. I mean, and it was a good studio, 24 track. Oh boy, had the sampler. Actually, it was um, down the street from where Buster Rhymes' moms used to live. Oh, no In way. Unidale, yeah. Some history there. So anyways, going back to uh, to that story, 
he came up with this concept. He was like, hey, uh, let's sample this this uh, this track. And I said, okay, what it is that you want to sample, you know? And he comes, you ever heard of the, the Japanese a- animation, Akira? Yeah. Yeah, man. And he goes, hey, this is what I want to sample. I couldn't hear what he was imagining. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yo, I don't, I don't see it, man. And he goes, don't worry about it. And he wasn't the type of individual that would go into a studio uh, rigorously or constantly. You know, he really wasn't that, you know, he wasn't a rapper, wasn't a, uh, a beat maker. But he was like, yo, li- trust me. Mm. And we get into the studio and then we start, I don't know what happened to the beat, but uh, he starts telling the, the producer, okay, do this, do that. And wow. I was like, holy shit, man. I hadn't I didn't imagine what he was hearing in his mind, but when it got down on the track, I looked at him in a different way and I was like, Holy shit, man, you really don't do not have to be musically inclined per se to have a good melody or a good good idea in your mind. I was like, Holy shit, man. Yeah, really like he was like away. directing people, like he was directing this guy, hey, this is what I want. Yeah, I want. he was like, Okay, uh go you know, he knew exactly what part to go to the D uh, I guess it was a DVD or whatever have you, and then uh he goes, all right, right here at this this moment. Hmm. Sample this and chop it up this way, and and do know, okay. Put the beat behind it, and I was like, holy shit, this motherfucker made a song, it, uh, it, and it wasn't a musical instrument. It was like a goddamn back effect. It was like <sighs> cha 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 cha. You know, what I mean? it was yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, that's I, what Doctor Dre is known yeah, for. Yeah, man, for... I was pleasantly surprised. I was like, holy shit, man. Yeah, what like the fuck, you been hiding? Doctor Dre is is. You know, Daz, Snoop's cousin, Daz, the, the producer, he produced a lot of the tracks on The Chronic. It, it, they say, I mean, I don't know how much truth there is to it, but that Dr. Dre kind of tells people what he likes, what he wants, what he likes to hear, play it like this, you know, chop the sample up like this to eat, you know, and it, 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 he has that ear. If you have that ear, man, you can go a long way. I feel like it's just having that ear is almost can almost be bigger than being an actual musician you know these musicians that come in and that kanye west does it a lot he'll add, he'll have his guitar player that he comes in every time he thinks one of his beats needs a guitar um you know he comes in and adds that for him and kanye pays him you know two thousand there you go and and it's, it's a big hit for kanye you know like it it's just uh it's interesting how, how that all works as a matter of fact on one of your uh one of the beats we're gonna play here this evening, you utilize that on the uh on the hunt, right? Right. You utilize a, a live musician. Right. You know, I've always thought about that. And I've 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 done it actually myself. I I I would plug in an acoustic or my electric and I would play the riff myself. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but there were other times where I've had ideas of of like a, a live violin or you know instrument of that nature and i'm like well i don't know anybody like that right to come in that'd be awesome you know what i mean but i don't I have a violinist come in i yeah. mean that'd be the wow. shit man that'd be i mean but but because there's a difference from the software violins and a live violin oh, come on man, man. it's just i don't want to say you can't compare it because some of the software utilizes some of the strings and percussions are fucking great yeah but there's nothing compared to having a human being you're looking at him and he's looking or she or he or she's looking back at you and you're like oh man add a little bit of mm. bravado this way and they're able to do it man it's it's nothing like it and then the energy to vibe off of and i guess that's why i i, I love being around other musicians because you could vibe off their feeling and they can vibe off of yours it's almost like playing inspire tennis. you inspire me and yeah man it's almost like playing tennis man i you know uh, i hit the ball to you you hit it back to me and, and here we go with the momentum yeah you know? it's like in life like i mean nobody wants to it's always more fun if you could do it with other people i have uh i got like three buddies that i make music with we've you know, we've we've known each other for a long time. They're my boys, right? And we just so happen to love music. Just, they love music just as much as I do, which yeah. is amazing. But my fiance was sometimes she doesn't understand. Like it can't. I can't just make a two hour session. I'm gonna go to this house in Orange County. Two hour session will bang out a beat. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. But it, it, it they can't have limits like that. Like I gotta be able to hang out with him. You know, right. have, maybe have a couple of drinks. You know, talk like. And then you start vibing. Vibing. You st- yes, you start vibing, and then it just it accumulates into something 
spectacular. It might be four beats yeah. in four hours. It might be one. Absolutely. Like, it's just it's it's that that the camaraderie that you feel with that person brings it to can create some good music. So I I can. It's just so different uh now making music now compared to how it used to be like i hear about artists just hey i'm gonna send you my verse never met him before you know i'm gonna send my verse to a producer i never met before but i like his beat hopefully he makes it sound good right. it's not as intimate right as, as i like that intimacy man like not no homo right no, but absolutely yeah it, you gotta be able to 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 vibe off that individual see what type of person he is and you know what great relationships no homo but great relationships spawn from that you know what yeah. i mean yeah um hey brother moving right along man hey what's going on this is vicky vic chilling with dj architect in the chapter of the architect and uh, i'm gonna play you my first beat here it's called her eyes made on the mpc 1000 